For many beachcombers, the vision of a shrimp boat stirs the imagination. Thoughts of bountiful harvests and a life at sea filled with ocean adventure have caused many a soul to pursue a life in commercial fishing. However, most of us simply enjoy the delicacies these vessels produce in restaurants and markets. Fishing cultures have flourished in many small coastal communities for most of the 20th century. Many of these communities grew from businesses that support a shrimp fishery. The chain begins with the fishermen who live their lives on the sea and stretches to the savory delicacy that we enjoy on our plates. But what do we really know about shrimpers and catching shrimp? Legend has it that for more than 2,000 years, shrimp have been harvested by fishermen around the world using dip nets and cast nets in shallow waters. However, shrimp could not be used as a viable seafood commodity because the essential ingredients required to build a fresh seafood industry were either unavailable or not well developed. Prior to the 1800s, there were no proven preservation techniques or means of reliable transportation. Profitable fresh shrimp commerce was limited to populated urban areas such as Charleston, Savannah, Havana, and New Orleans. By the late 1800s, many of these problems had been overcome. Shrimp were cooked in a strong brine, adding several weeks to the shelf life. In pubs, these salted shrimp were often given away like peanuts or popcorn to whet the appetites of patrons. But Civil War reconstruction efforts in the form of expanded railway systems were finally reaching coastal villages. Increased competition among steamship lines was lowering transportation costs and improving its availability. Fresh shrimp could now reach the lucrative New York City market. Still, at the turn of the century, supply was limited. Most shrimp were taken from inshore rivers and estuaries using dip nets, cast nets, or beach seines. Hall seines yielded a higher catch, but using them was more expensive and much more labor intensive. Often six to eight men or horses were needed to handle a large seine. One end of the net would be staked or held in position on the beach while a small rowboat paid out the neatly stacked net. With the rowboat traveling in a circle back to the staked end, the crew would slowly haul in the net, forming an ever narrowing circle and herding the shrimp until they could be easily landed with dip nets or cast nets. This simple form of fishing required little capital investment. Sometime between 1900 and 1902, the first major technological advancement in the fishery was introduced by Solicito Salvador, who later became known as Mike, an Italian merchant mariner who entered the business in Fernandina, Florida in 1899. Salvador immediately began experimenting in all phases of the industry, from production to marketing. To improve the speed and efficiency of his seining operation, Salvador equipped his boat with a small one-cylinder gasoline engine. This is believed to be the first time a power-driven boat was used in the shrimp fishery and most likely occurred in 1901. Salvador's use of a power-driven vessel fostered a renewed interest in the shrimp fishery. Florida's production alone soared from 39,000 pounds in 1897 to over 3 million in 1902. As word of the technology spread, production increased steadily over the next 10 years. Prices remained constant and shrimpers were able to sell all the shrimp they could land. The consistently high volume of shrimp created a significant improvement in product transportation to the big city markets in the Northeast. Mike Salvador is largely responsible for this success. During the years that followed, Salvador continued to focus his energies on the shrimp trade. In 1906, he was joined by his brothers-in-law from Sicily, Salvatore Versaggi and Antonio Poli. The addition of these two men allowed him to devote more time to shrimp marketing. He opened S. Salvador & Company the same year in a dockside fish house equipped with cold storage facilities. Just as Salvador was fortunate to be surrounded by the fertile waters and barrier islands of the southeastern U.S. Atlantic Bight, he was also lucky to have the aid of Sal Versaggi and Antonio Poli. These two families would pioneer and persevere in the shrimp industry throughout the 20th century. Their names remain some of the most well-known in the business today. My family uh, 
first came to St. Augustine, my grandfather uh, and uh, his brothers, uh, to go into the uh, shrimping industry. In the 40s, uh, my father and his brother-in-law, my uncle, uh, determined that they wanted to uh, establish a supply uh, business here catering to the shrimp fleets. Uh, and in 1946, uh, they, they did just that. And uh, that business, uh, the Marine Supply and Oil Company, where we are today on the banks of the San Sebastian River, is, uh, still continues on. Sheer volume provided the answer to the transportation problems. In fact, the ability to deliver large, fresh southern shrimp to market increased the already strong demand. Salvador's lead was quickly followed by others in the business, producing an extensive trade by 1912. During this period, the fishery was bustling with a cultural diversity that would eventually help define the American melting pot. Many of them left their countries in search of a better life in a promising new land. These were tough, hardworking people who would brave the ocean environment and toil together in the tropical heat. They were Italians, Greeks, Sicilians, and Portuguese, Native Americans, African Americans, French, and Spanish. A new American, yet global, culture was emerging, developing a cohesive industry of essentially family-run businesses. Shrimping, like all commercial fisheries, is a unique industry in that it creates new money. It actually builds the economic base. It doesn't just circulate existing money. Only fishing, farming, mining, and the forestry industries actually create new money. The benefits are compounded through those who provide services to these industries, for example, processing, packaging, distributing, and finally retail sales. These new dollars then circulate like service-based industry dollars and turn into wages, supply purchases, and other components of the economy. The dollars help communities grow and prosper. By 1910, the shrimp industry in the southeastern U.S. was emerging as one of the most valuable among coastal counties. Some of the other industries it would attract include boat building yards and haul out facilities, engine sales and machine repair shops, ice manufacturers and net makers, and marine hardware supply stores. Shrimp production in Fernandina increased an incredible 2,000 fold between 1897 and 1912. But in 1913, the adoption and perfection of the otter trawl on the Atlantic seaboard had an even more dramatic effect. Originally developed in the mid-19th century by the English for the halibut fishery, the otter trawl was used to catch bottom-dwelling fish. The rig consisted essentially of a net shaped like a flattened comb. A trawl board, also known as a door, was connected to either end of the net's large mouth. The doors were attached to towing lines in a way such that when under tow, water pressure forced the doors outward, spreading the sides of the mouth open. Heavy runners made of iron bars attached to the bottom of the doors held the entire rig close to the sea floor, allowing it to slide across sand or mud bottoms. The first patent was registered in Britain in 1894. The idea of using an otter trawl to catch shrimp in the U.S. seemed to appear simultaneously in two locations. A U.S. Bureau of Fisheries report states, the application of the otter trawl to shrimp fishing in this country apparently was first attempted between 1912 and 1915. In 1912 and again in 1914, small otter trawls were used by the Bureau of Fisheries to collect marine farms for the Bureau's laboratory at Beaufort, North Carolina. Local fishermen observed that quantities of shrimp were taken during these experimental hauls and devised larger trawls specifically for shrimp fishing. At this time, the trawl was being applied in shrimp fisheries near Fernandina, Florida. Captain Billy Corkum from Massachusetts is the man generally credited with developing the first trawl adaptation used in Fernandina. A fleet of New England fishing vessels had been fishing for bluefish off Fernandina during the winter of 1912 and 1913. When catch levels dropped sharply, the fleet was forced into port. Corkum watched the shrimpers working their haul seines and built a modified otter trawl to test on shrimp. He had such phenomenal success that the local shrimpers quickly copied his design. 
A similar design, built specifically for shrimping, was developed and tested in 1913 by Salvador Tringali. As net maker for the Salvador and Versace fleet, the Sicilian adapted a design from a sardine net used in his native country. The doors were only three feet long and 12 inches high. What is believed to be the first offshore deep water trawler appeared later in the same year. The vessel was the automatic, a 33-foot vessel powered by a 24-horsepower automatic engine owned by Fernandina bar pilot Captain William Jones Davis. He equipped a boat with a trawl brought to him by a Belgian ship captain. Local pogey fishermen had told him they sometimes caught very large shrimp in their nets offshore. Davis put his trawl to work in the offshore waters and harvested an unprecedented concentration of shrimp. This find led to the birth of today's modern offshore shrimp fishery. The trawl and the region's abundant and renewable shrimp resources provided the base for rapid production increases. By 1917, the auto trawl had gained universal acceptance in the commercial fleet. The typical shrimp trawler was a 25-foot long wooden boat with a 10-foot beam and a net displacement of three or four tons. The boats pulled one trawl and usually had a one or two-man crew. Both two and four cycle engines were common. All were gasoline fueled, typically generating about 15 horsepower. On the eve of America's entry into World War I, the essential features of today's worldwide shrimp industry were present along the Atlantic coast. Today's fresh shrimp trade with its vast network of markets and sophisticated distribution system descends directly from the efforts of the East Coast pioneers. Shrimp boats would become bigger and more powerful with greater range than the 1917 fleets, but these are differences in scale, not basic technology or methodology. In fact, the otter trawl of today, although considerably refined, remains basically unchanged in its design. The specific components that did change improved the overall efficiency of the harvesting operation. Boats grew larger and more seaworthy and added more horsepower to pull more and larger nets. Holding capacity and deck space increased. When the larger catches became too heavy to be pulled all board by hand, winches were employed with block and tackle mounted on A-frames to facilitate the work. U.S. shrimp landings were only 10 million pounds in 1890. By 1930, the landings had shot up to 88 million pounds and the boom was only beginning. As the 25 and 35 foot class trawler swept aside the Seine, now 40 and 50 foot vessels were replacing the smaller boats. The increased length could only be accommodated by completely redesigning the boats being built. The skills and craftsmanship the immigrant boat builders brought with them from their homelands now came into play. As the shrimping industry evolved, there was more and more demand was placed for more and more shrimp. And of course, they knew that they needed larger nets and larger nets were developed. But with that, they needed larger boats. They needed more power to pull the larger net. And what they tried to do, they tried to take the same traditional plan that had been built uh, and, and expand this and stretch it. Well, you could only stretch it so far and, you, and it would only accommodate so much power. In 1941, my father, Jimmy Dionis, came here from Greece and he redesigned and drew new plans for a new boat. Uh, in the 60s, uh, in the 50s, we saw boats going 55 to 60 feet. In the 60s, they were up to 70 feet and larger. And thus, they accommodated the more power that was needed to pull the larger nets. There was a space on the boat that was needed. And that was the super trawler. Yeah, that was the birth of the super trawler as we know it today in the shrimping industry. These larger vessels allowed fishermen to venture into deeper waters using more powerful engines to accommodate larger nets. World War II was now over and a period of prosperity swept the nation. Surplus machinery and new technologies fueled a boom in U.S. industries. Gear innovations and fishing ground explorations expanded. The sons of Mike Salvador, Felix and John, located the Dry Tortuga pink shrimp grounds near Key West in 1949. A few years later, the massive brown shrimp fishery was developed in the offshore waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Shrimp boat yards sprang to life throughout the region. 
One of the greatest milestones for the fishery was the development of the quick freezing process. Shrimp was no longer a perishable product subject to market price fluctuations. Overnight, shrimp became a stable commodity, with the producer having a modicum of control over when he wanted to sell. This solidified many of America's seafood packers and processors as cornerstones in the seafood industry. Freezing paved the way for the phenomenal shrimp import business of today, which imported over 450 million kilograms of shrimp in 1999, valued at nearly four and a half billion dollars. This industry alone employs over 25,000 workers. Over a few decades in the middle of the 20th century, the shrimp industry exploded. Marine electronics of all kinds opened new frontiers. Boats were no longer limited to nearshore fishing and returning to the dock by nightfall. Diesel engines replaced gasoline. Nylon dipped webbing replaced tarred cotton. Boats were now big enough to be outfitted with galleys, bathrooms, and sleeping quarters. During this time, crew size went from one or two men to three or four, as the evolution from a single net to double rigs became almost universal, later evolving into the popular four-banger in the 1970s. The development of propeller nozzles also provided additional thrust and were popular in the Gulf of Mexico. It was during this time that the shrimp boat was credited as one of the most efficient operations in the world. Three men could effectively handle all aspects of an 80 or even a 100-foot boat. Domestic shrimp production soared and eventually approached 300 million pounds. Through the 1950s, the government did little to aid or hinder the shrimp industry through gear development or regulation. The innovations of the maverick industry entrepreneurs had driven